Bestbookbits.com presents Where Good Ideas Come From, The Natural History of Innovation by Stephen Johnson. The printing press, the pencil, the flush toilet, the battery, these are all great ideas. But where do they come from? What kind of environment breeds them? What sparks the flash of brilliance? How do we generate breakthrough technologies that push forward our lives, our society, our culture? Stephen Johnson's answers are revelatory as he identifies the seven key patterns behind genuine innovation and traces them across time and disciplines. From Darwin and Freud to the halls of Google and Apple, Johnson investigates the innovation hubs throughout modern time and pulls out the approaches and commonalities that seem to appear at moments of originality. The written and audio summary can be found on our website, bestbookbits.com. So without further ado, I bring you the book summary of where good ideas come from. The book in bullets. Number one, there are many parallels between the natural sciences and commercial innovation. Number two, most innovations come in six circumstances. Number one, small improvements based on advances in nearby fields. Two, liquid networks of connectivity, allowing people to learn from others. Three, hunches when slowly grow into fully fledged ideas. And number four, serendipity, random inputs that inspire. Number five is errors. Not getting what you expect can be educational. And number six is acceptation. Adapting something for another purpose. Platforms taking advantage of another innovation to make an innovation. The model of the isolated inventor has historical validity. But over the centuries, innovation is increasingly from people working in groups or networks. While profit has always been a good motivation for innovation, More innovation may come from open systems because of the free flow of information that occurs in non-commercial settings. This is a very interesting and easy to read book about creativity and innovation. The author identifies seven patterns of innovation found in the human and natural world, then illustrates the patterns with a variety of stories and explanations. The book is a bit of a walk through some obscure history, but this is part of what it makes it fun and eye-opening. The book begins with Darwin's visit to the Killing Islands on his trip around the world and the observations that launched his development of the theory of evolution. In the middle of what is essentially a biological desert, coral organisms build a reef in the face in constant erosion from the waves. Each coral organism is a tiny and no match for the wave, but bit by bit the organisms by working together build a structure that resides erosion overall. The coral atoll is a triumph of the incremental growth and becomes the foundation for an incredibly dense and diverse ecosystem. This is Darwin's paradox, diversity in the desert. Jumping ahead 100 years, Max Kilber discovered that the heart rate and metabolic rate could be predicted across a huge range of organism sizes by simple negative power laws, power law, which helped integrate biology and physics. Jumping ahead another 70 years, Jeffrey West led a team that showed that the same power laws apply to the structure of cities. Cities are like large organisms, really large ones, but some functions do not follow the metabolic power laws. For example, creativity linked activities tend to follow positive power laws, increase the population of a city by tenfold, and innovation increases 17 fold. The adjacent possible. The pattern is the pattern of incremental advance and is the dominant form of innovation. The intent is not to dismiss its importance, but to emphasize that few innovations are single great leaps, but the accumulation of many small steps. In effect, each advance creates the new zone of possibilities that can be exploited. The chapter begins with the story of the introduction of the first incubator for a newborn humans. Based on existing technology for raising chickens, from a simple start as a wooden box and water bottles, the modern incubator is a technological miracle. One of the miracles is that it can't be used in much of the developing world because the supporting technical infrastructure is absent. There is no adjacent possibility of sophistication electronic diagnosis and repair. To remedy this, designers created an infant incubator based on car parts. These are readily available, faults are easy to diagnose, and the skills for auto maintenance are present in society or will be until cars become too computerized. Liquid networks. Innovation occurs when ideas meet and merge. Innovation occurs when ideas meet and merge. Thus, innovation inevitably has an environmental, cultural component. 
the author uses the metaphor of chemistry in the three states of matter, gas, liquid, and solid. In a gas, the molecules move chaotically and reactions are rare. In a solid, the molecules barely move at all and all reactions are rare. In liquid, molecules move easily and reactions are plentiful. More relevant to life and the innovation metaphor. Well, the liquid is water, which has some structure and is a solvent to many other molecules. The structure of water promotes many reactions and by dissolving a wide array of molecules, permits a huge range of reactions. What the water provides is a fluid network. Similarly, organizations can be a chaotic or rigid, or consequently not innovative. But an organization that provides some structure, specifically the opportunity for rapid localized restructuring, may find itself more innovative. In this sense, large cities have some structure, but a lot of fluidity of potential relationships. Innovative people with part of a big idea are more likely to encounter another person with a related part of the big idea and be able to find a cheap place to set up shop and find customers and financing and media to advertise. These networks affect support ideas, colliding, and then bring board to action. Naturally, there are rigid or chaotic big cities and fluid big cities, and these differ in their innovative output. Similarly, there are rigid or chaotic big organizations and fluid big organizations. The evolution of culture in and around a big organization will have a significant impact on its innovative potential. One view of the Renaissance is that the northern Italian cities were highly connected with each other but independent, which allowed people and information to flow between them. When the first market towns emerged in Italy, they didn't magically create some higher level group consciousness, they simply widened the pool of minds that could come up with and share good ideas. This is not the wisdom of the crowd, but the wisdom of someone in the crowd. It's not that the network itself is smart, it's that the individuals get smarter because they're connected to the network. The author did not address this question, but one might wonder why the Renaissance happened in the fluid city, states of northern Italy, but not the more established Rome, which was much bigger and denser. Much more recently, a study of scientists at work was conducted by placing cameras, voice recorders in their labs, offices, and conference rooms. They transcribed all their discussions and coded them for their purpose. Interviews with the scientists also recorded what they were thinking privately. The key learning was that the most important innovative tool in use was the conference room, because this is where scientists discussed their observations, critiqued analysis, solved problems together, and refined their thinking. While the scientists had individual creative thoughts, the semi-structured interaction with others was what fueled the thinking leaps of each person. Most people in companies complain about meetings, but maybe meetings about innovation differ from regular business meetings. It would be interesting to consider the competitive advantage that a company might gain because it learned to conduct innovative meetings. In a similar way, this section of the book suggested that big organizations can increase their innovativeness by increasing connectivity, but also imply that it is difficult or impossible to predict which connections would be beneficial. While connection for connection's sake might seem wasteful, it might be the only productive approach. Finally, this section, the slow hunch and serendipity. Genuine insights are hard to come by, and so most great ideas take shape in a partial incomplete form. They have the seeds of something profound, but they lack a key element that can turn a hunch into something truly powerful. And more often than not, that missing element is somewhere else, living as a hunch in someone else's head. One of the interesting features of the book is how the story builds from chapter to chapter. Cities are liquid networks where people can exchange ideas and information. Some of what is exchanged in hunches. When you increase your network size and diversity, you increase the probability of meeting people with hunches that can complete your hunch and make it into something useful. One method of creating ideas is by forcing hunches to collide to see if they connect. These hunches are not quick insights, but hunches that develop over time as a person immerses themselves in a working domain. For example, Charles Darwin recorded in his notebook in 1838 that after reading an essay by Malthus on the population, that he had an insight into the origin of species and at last had a theory to work with. It seems like a flash of insight, but a careful study of his earlier notebooks from 1837 
showed that he had all the concepts that would become the theory of evolution for at least one year, but did not realize it until he read Malthus. In fact, working backwards, it becomes clear that the pieces of the puzzle begin to assemble a year before in his observations of the reefs in the Killing Islands in 1836, based on his observations in the Galapagos Islands in 1835. This slow development of an idea, then the intellectual confirmation of that idea can be slow and must survive in the face of many challenges. But most simply, you must remember and process the information whose importance you don't yet recognize. The serendipity of Darwin's observation of diversification among finches took three years to develop. People in this time period couldn't record things in their blogs or look in Wikipedia. The tool of choice in that day was a commonplace. A commonplace was a sort of journal where people copied passages, their own thoughts and doodles, draft and revised essays, and carried out many of their functions of a diary. Because these combined the author's own thoughts together with the thoughts of others, these mashups provided the way to keep memories alive and permit recombination. Darwin revisited these notebooks and keep renewing this information in his mind. These commonplaces mixed order and chaos. Interestingly, the brain works exactly this way. There are periods when the brain's electrical system is perfectly synchronized, REM sleep, for example, but there are periods when the electrical system looks like pure noise. Interestingly, it seems that the brains with longer periods of chaotic behavior score higher on IQ test. The thought is that these chaotic periods are when the brain makes new neural connections and thus combines new information into a hunch. In a sense, the brain is a dense liquid network which enables connections. Supported by reading a commonplace where the randomness resembles liquidity and the meeting and talking with others, creativity arises from multiple layers of liquid networks interacting. Though not mentioned in the book, Thomas Edison was famous for keeping notebooks with his ideas, theories and speculations. He dedicated 20 minutes a day to looking at old notebooks and of the course was inventor or co-inventor of more than 1,000 US patents. The World Wide Web originated from the slow development of a commonplace by Tim Berners-Lee. And today the web is the greatest and messiest commonplace in history. There are now IT tools that help you search web pages for interesting content and allow you to fuel your serendipity. The author takes the time to discuss how systems can be designed to foil the realization of hunches. Two different FBI officers in the summer of 2001 identified the possibility of terrorists hijacking a plane for the use as a bomb. One developed from a long study of terrorist thinking and the other from a particular incident. Neither were considered serious and the system used by the FBI essentially ensured that the fact that there are two such hunches nearly at the same time would be ignored. It is not enough to have a hunch. There needs to be institutional understanding that hunches are the beginning of ideas and that most hunches need to find other hunches to become an actual idea. The FBI did not have that understanding, but Edison's laboratory did. 3M and Google have it today. Error. Often the story of innovation is told as a series of positive steps leading to the aha moment and success. This probably does happen, but the more likely case is that something that went wrong and that made somebody look again try again and rethink their approach. In early 1900, Lee DeForest was experimenting with a spark gap machine when he noticed that a nearby candle flame changed color when he created a spark. Over a few years of experimentation, he went from glass tubes filled with various gases and two electrodes to tubes with three electrodes. Pretty soon, he was bending one of the electrodes inside the tube and had the first audio amplifier suitable for use in radios. The problem with the story is that he thought the gas in the tube was critical, but it was not vacuum works best. He thought that the candle flame changed color because of the electromagnetic radiation from the spark, but it was not. Shock waves from the sound of the spark condensed the flame, making it hotter. Originally an amplifier, it turned out to be a switch and the foundation of semiconductors, which are the foundation of modern fast computers which are the foundation of the digital revolution. DeForest later admitted that almost every theory that he had about how his device was working was wrong. But that failure never stopped the work from proceeding. 
the original stories of antibiotics, photography, pacemakers, the discovery of oxygen, the Big Bang, and Teflon all include some significant failure event. What is significant in these stories is that somebody eventually perceived the event not as a mistake, but as an observation. In the section of liquid networks above, the recordings of scientists meeting were discussed. One interesting observation of the scientists at work was that when a scientist reported on an experiment gone wrong, their usual explanation was that they had made a mistake. But others who were not part of the experiment would interpret the results as a novel observation and suggest experiments to confirm the new observation. Sometimes they were mistakes, but sometimes they were discoveries. Being right keeps you in place. Being wrong forces you to explore. Charlie Nemeth conducted a psychology experiment with groups of people. In the basic experiment, subjects were shown a group of slides using a basic color scheme and then asked to report on the color. It was green. In the subsequent step, they were asked to free associate words based on the slides. The selection of the words produced in the circumstances is highly predictable and few people produce unusual words in the first few minutes. In the second experiment, the subject group was seated with a ringer who would report seeing a different color. It was blue. In the subsequent free association, groups used many more unusual words, apparently made more creative by exposure to bad information. Examination of other situations shows that more creative thinking occurs in environments with more noise, where disagreement is common and data is not clean. One perspective on efficiency is that perfection improves quality and efficiency, but an alternative view is that the lack of noise in a perfect environment disables our ability to make new connections to see things differently. It is a surprise that teaches us not the confirmation of what we expect. Acceptation. Acceptation equals external adaptation, where an idea or method from one domain is applied in another domain. For example, Gutenberg adapt the wine press to work as a printing press. Acceptation is a complementary to the idea of the adjacent possible. The web that existed today is exapted from the combination of a backup telephone system developed by the military and a computer language developed to share academic data. Analogy and metaphor are tools of acceptation. Acceptation relates to the importance of cities in innovation. Where cities grow bigger, they become more diverse. A big city has more different industries and businesses than a smaller city, and the more opportunities to observe other people at work. Martin Roof studied the social networks of the Stanford Business Social Graduates. The most creative graduates measured by patents, product introduction, businesses started, etc., generally had the most diverse networks that extended beyond their own organization and included people with very different backgrounds. These people were able to connect a wide range of examples to their own situation and extract solutions. Another other studies show that the most innovative people within organizations often form bridges between groups and can reapply solutions from other contexts into theirs. Apple offers an interesting counter example. Apple barely interacts with other organizations and its leaders were not networkers. However, Apple had a practice called concurrent development where all the disciplines work on a project interact right from the beginning. Through this causes projects to start with a lot of argument and confusion. This process prevents designs from being diluted over time and allows the methods of different disciplines to fertilize each other throughout the project. Early delays are overcome by later alignment and clarity. Centuries ago, the coffee houses allowed people to meet and exchange ideas. People learned from each other and adapted ideas to their own work. The internet and Starbucks served a similar purpose today. Liquid networks of people finding a little serendipity that allows them to excavate a solution into a nearby domain. Platforms. Platforms represent the last big category of innovation types. A platform in this context is an innovation that spawns many more innovations. A beaver pond is a natural platform that provides an ecosystem suitable for numerous fish, amphibians, birds, and plants. A technological platform example is GPS, originally developed to help submarines locate themselves accurately. The technology has been expated to help motorists find their way, cyclists to track their rides, and Twitter users to attach their tweets to a location. 
Twitter itself is an example of the intersection between existing platforms of SMS, internet on one side, and the phone apps being developed by companies and users on the other side. Building Twitter from scratch would have been impractical, but building by repurposing other technologies made its development very feasible. Twitter's developers made another critical decision that made its platform more attractive. They open sourced essentially everything. Users developed the at and the hash conventions. Companies built apps. Rather than capture competitive advantage, the Twitter developers capture cooperative advantage through their platform. The book points out that technology originally developed to fight nuclear war, internet, GPS, etc. is now applied in combination with numerous other platforms to tell others how you enjoyed lunch on Twitter. Stepping back, the way that innovation is explained would lead you to think that in most innovation is a product of individuals' efforts, often isolated individuals. Examination of innovations in isolation may support this view, but stepping back shows that innovation has changed over the past 500 years. You can imagine two dimensions for an innovation. The first dimension relates to how networked the inventors was, small team or highly networked. The second dimension is intended purpose, profit or knowledge sharing. Simplistically, these two dimensions form a two by two grid like the following. Next, the author examined and classified the top 200 inventions and discoveries since the printing press into one of the four quadrants over time. Solo inventions on the left from 1400 to 1600. Then in the middle, 1600 to 1800. Up the top we have for profit and down the bottom we have for knowledge. Then looking on the right, you will see 1800 to present, we have networked. Massive jump from 55 for knowledge to 35 for profit and networked. Early innovation was mostly individualistic and knowledge orientated, but over time, networking came to dominate both for the profit and knowledge worlds. In 66% of innovation was individualist before 1600. 32% of modern innovation is non-networked. Profit motivation has also increased over time, though not as much, 24% to 34%. Individual inventors seeking profit has never dominated the big innovations, probably because they cut themselves off from outside input while protecting their ideas from others. Most of the sources of good ideas described above require relatively open systems for people and information to interact in. The lower right quadrant is the most open of them all characterized by open sharing through semi-formal networks. Ideas and information flow allowing small hunches to collide, solutions to be repurposed and platforms to be constructed. Darwin, famous for survival of the fittest, also observed that much of life depended on complex interactions, connection and cooperation. The resolution of Darwin's paradox is this fact. Cooperation and competition are not mutually exclusive. The reef rainforest and big city foster exchange and permit exploration of the adjacent possible. The collision of slow hunches and the exploitation of new platforms and competition is these places is fierce. Organizations wanting to drive innovation will want to think about how to increase random connection, productive errors and slow hunches, not usually the goals of efficiency minded organizations. And that's a wrap on where good ideas come from. Subscribe to the channel and take a look at hundreds of book summaries uploaded previously. To find hundreds of written summaries, check out our website, bestbookbits.com. And for hundreds of audio podcast summaries, find us on mixcloud.com forward slash bestbookbits. If you like reading and want to connect and get involved in sharing knowledge and spreading great book summaries, connect with myself by emailing info at bestbookbits.com to join us. Thanks for watching and listening and have yourself an amazing day. Take care.